Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this evening. Very glad to have you on. We do have quite a few registered, so uh, I'm sure people will still be joining in here. I'm going to go ahead and share screen. So the title of our webinar this evening is Monetizing Your Regenerative Advantage. And we are especially privileged this evening to have three of our team members who will be doing a lot of the presenting. We have Burke Teichert, Randy Little, and Kent Donaga presenting this evening. And I will be uh, introducing each one of them when their portion of the presentation starts. So first, I'm going to go to Burke Teichert. Burke has had a very distinguished career in the livestock industry. Uh, he has managed some of the largest ranches in the world and has also been a contributing author uh, to many industry publications. Uh, we are very honored to have Bert having joined the Understanding Ag Team and to be a dedicated part of our staff. So, Bert, thank you for being here with us this evening, and we're going to open up the webinar with you. So, turn it over to you, Bert. Well, thank you very much, Alan, and thank you all for being with us tonight. Title Profitable Ranching or Farming or Ranching. Is it possible? Well, yes, it is if you know how. And uh, it's kind of sad to say, but not nearly enough people know how. We need to understand several things. We need to know what our goals are and over time try to develop a shared vision with our team. And if our team is only our family, we still need to have that shared vision. So we're all pulling together. Those goals will be financial, financial goals. There will be goals around land and soil health, and there will be goals around our quality of life. Then we'll discuss briefly here in a minute what to manage, three ways to improve profit, and five essentials. The four areas to manage <clears throat> are production, economics and finance, marketing, and people. And the reason I show this list, because these are questions that each individual needs to answer for themselves. But most of us are attracted to agriculture because of production. We love the animals, we love the plants, we love the crops, and we're, we're just attracted to producing. And a lot of our institutions kind of encourage us to just produce more and more, thinking that more is better. But we need to look at the economics and finance, and then we find out that that's not always the case. And then we must be good marketers. <clears throat> and most of us aren't. And I, I don't mean to be demeaning when I say that. I was in that same boat for a long time, and I'm not sure that I'm still a real good marketer, but I'm a whole lot better than I, than I was a good number of years ago. And then people. We all have a team we work with. Sometimes those people are, are ourselves and our family and our, and our employees. But also on our team can be our banker, our accountant, the people from whom we buy services and inputs that we use, people who buy our products. And if we manage those, those relationships well, many of those people can be helpful to us. Okay, Alan? There are three ways <clears throat> to improve profit. And you'll look at this list and you'll say, oh, there's a lot more ways than that. And I want to suggest to you that everything you can think of to improve profit will fit under one and sometimes two of those, those three items. The first is to increase turnover. And I'll be honest, I've borrowed these from the Ranch for Profit School, but modified them a little bit to look at them just a little differently. 
turnover is more than just buying another ranch and have more units to sell. When I talk about turnover, I'm talking about creating more units of saleable product on the same size operation. So if we can do that, that's certainly going to increase profitability. Then we need to decrease overheads. Most of us fall in love with our stuff. And we have too much equipment, buildings, etc. And uh, if we can learn how to pair those back, we just do a lot better job. And the ranchers and farmers that I've worked with on a consulting basis that have made the greatest progress the quickest have been those that recognized they had a lot more stuff than they needed and learned how to cut it back without affecting income very much. But costs went down markedly. And then if we can improve gross margin, and the gross margin are your total returns, which is just your gross sales receipts, plus or minus the value of the inventory change that occurs over time. And from that number, you subtract your direct costs. And direct costs are basically, are basically feed and, and vet costs, vet supplies or vet services. And it's whole ranch profit that we want to work at. Profit per acre or whole ranch profit, not production or even profit per cow. If we start looking at production or profit per cow, we can be led down a bad path. And I might just quickly point out that if you've got <clears throat> 1,000, and most of you don't have operations that big, but I'll use it for easy arithmetic. If you've got 1,000 uh, 1,400 pound cows, you should be able to run 1,400 1,000 pound cows on the same resource base. Not quite as many, but really close. They basically consume in relationship to their size and their weight. As they get bigger, they that's not quite linear. It's not quite one for one, but close enough, we can just about say it's that way. So you've got 1,000 cows or 1,400 cows instead of 1,000 weaning calves that, yes, are smaller, but not smaller in relationship to the size of the cows. And so you wean more pounds of calf per acre, and you all know the smaller calf sells for more per pound than a big calf, so you've got more pounds and selling all those pounds at a higher price. So we've got to be real careful. Profit per acre is what we're looking for. Five essentials of successful ranch management. I came up with this list a good number of years ago, and I've followed it and used it for a long time, and I'm convinced. Now, these, these aren't things you necessarily do on a daily basis, but it's how you approach, how you approach the job of managing. Our approach needs to be both integrative and holistic, and we're going to have a little course on this in January. And there I'll dive into this a little more and explain what I mean by that. But by integrate, we're putting pieces together. And by being holistic, we're trying to make the best holistic decision, the decision that's best for the whole operation. There are no, as Alan has told us many times, there are no singular effects. They compound and they cascade and they move forward. So we've got to be able to, to, to see that, learn how to see it, learn how to think that way. Then we should strive for continuous improvement of the key resources, land, livestock, people. And in January, we'll talk about that. Improving the land, we like good grazing, good grazing, adaptive grazing, multi-paddocks, livestock, cattle that are adapted to your environment, and people, people who just get better and better, smarter and smarter, if I can say it that way, and if you can have the land and the livestock and the people all getting better, all improving, you're going to be more and more profitable. And we'll, we'll have plenty of time to discuss that. Then use of good planning and decision-making tools. 
and our when I was a youngster growing up, the computer filled a whole room. Today, we've got such nice tools to get our decision-making tools in front of us, easy to use quickly. And we just need to assemble those tools and use them. Then we must wage war on cost. I've talked about overhead costs, but then we have to wage war on the, on the uh, direct costs, the inputs we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And why do we have to wage war on cost? Be nice if we could just ignore it, wouldn't it? But we wage war on cost because of competition. You know, people don't have to eat meat. I think they'll die young if they don't, but that's their choice. Uh, and if they do eat meat, it doesn't have to be beef, which is my, my meat of choice. And then if we are producing meat, whether it be lamb or goat or chicken or livestock cattle we need to be able to produce it at a cost at a cost that will make it profitable when we sell it in the marketplace in other words we've got to be able to sell it at a price and be able to produce at lower than that price or we don't get to stay in business if if our neighbors can produce a pound of calf for 10 cents a pound cheaper than we can they get to stay in business longer. And then we must place an emphasis on marketing. Just becomes very important. If we can if we can sell everything for just a little more per head or just a little more per pound with very little effort on our part, that makes a huge difference in the gross income and thus the net profit. Now, there are some major determinants of profit. And again, each one of these, we could spend a lot of time on each one, but quickly to go through them. Enterprise mix and choices. Your choices of enterprise. Is it, is it cattle? Is it dairy cattle? Is it crops? Or is it a mix of crops? Is it small ruminants? Is it a combination of those? Those choices become extremely important. And then let's just say you zero in on Cadillac because that's what you like. And then you need to ask, okay, what works best? Do I just want a cow-calf operation because I like cows and calves and I raise my own replacement heifers? Or would a terminal mating situation be better? And I might suggest that it usually is where you buy replacement cows. Notice I didn't say heifers, buy replacement cows and mate them all to a, to a bull or to bulls that target your marketplace and what they want there and then sell all the calves and buy more replacement cows to replace cows that were open and dry and so forth. But stalkers are, a lot of years, stalkers are more profitable than cows and calves. Or if you run cows and calves, maybe keeping them over as stalkers can be a really good enterprise. So there are a lot of things and Kent will show a lot of ways to use stalkers and even using cows as stalkers when we get into our school. Okay, overheads, and I've talked about those already, but people, we are overheads. So overheads just need to be reduced as much as possible. We've got to have them, we've got to have land, it's an overhead, we've got to have some facilities, they're overheads. We've got to have some people, their overheads too. And the people have to have their tools and equipment. But that's what we, that's why we've got to be careful with. Stocking rate. Stocking rate's a huge determinant of profit. And for the cow-calf enterprise, cow size and milk production become really important. Smaller cows giving less milk, you can run more of them on the same acre and wean, wean more pounds of calf per acre, and then remember, sell those calves at a higher price. Soil health and grazing management, thats they are probably the biggest hitters on this list, except for your enterprise mix and, and marketing. And, and, those, and even those aren't always ahead of soil health with grazing and pasture management. I know, I know operators that using good soil health practices have doubled 
and then tripled their carrying capacity. And when their carrying capacity got increased, then they were able to increase the stocking rate. Carrying capacity being the supply, stocking rate being the demand. Then a ratio that's very important, fed feed versus grazed feed. Anytime you put a machine between the mouth of the cow and her feed source, it just costs money. And so more days, if you can feed more days, even all year or graze all year, or many more days by changes in your management and feed less days. It's a huge and powerful tool for profitability. The choice of your calving season. The day a cow has a calf, her requirement for nutrients almost doubles. Not quite, but it, it's up there pretty high. And if mother nature can provide that for her and she can go out and graze it, it's a whole lot better than you having to feed it to her. So if you can choose a calving season that enables that cow to take care of her calf and herself and do it in a good time and when her nutrient requirements are lower, that's when you're using the lower amount and quality of nutrients that Mother Nature is providing on your farm or ranch. Okay, realized herd fertility. And that just gets back to turnover. You'd like every single cow to get pregnant and every single cow to have a live calf to sell. We know that's not going to happen, but as we move in that direction with better management, we're going to be better off. Why is input use for optimum production? Just feed inputs, for example. I want to project at least a two for one return for every dollar spent. And don't have time to talk about why I do that tonight, but we will later. Marketing. And then marketing, we can just do a lot better job. Uh, just in, in cull cow marketing. First of all, I, I turned them from cull cows into market cows. And instead of getting cull cow price, I started getting a three to $500 premium for them, which made just a world of difference. And I think we can show you some ways to do those kinds of things too. Adapted cows, calving season, and grazing management. Those three things are interconnected in the way we like to manage. They just, when you change one of them, you're probably gonna change the other a little and vice versa. But those three things are interconnected and they have effects on soil health, carrying capacity, fed feed versus grazed feed, overheads, Labor and facilities are part of overheads, but I wanted to set those apart. And herd fertility. They have effects on all of those. So we'll, we'll talk about those at some length. And then kind of in summary of what I've just said, and hard to understand in a few minutes, but if you can reduce overheads, achieve excellent herd fertility, mark it well, do that, and then strive to improve these three key ratios acres per cow. You want that to diminish. Fewer and fewer acres per cow. You can make that happen. That drives profit in a big way. Cows per FTE. FTE being full-time equivalent of labor. The more cows one person can handle and take care of, the more profitable you will be. The person, the employee, or the manager, if it's you yourself, if you can handle more cows, it's just more profitable because it's not just you, it's your it's your pickup, it's your side-by-side -side or four-wheeler. It's your saddle horses if you're a saddle horse cowboy. It's, uh, it's a set of tools you use. And all of those costs, it's the housing that, that you live in. All, all that, all that uh, cost that goes with labor is way more than the salary. And so you just, it, it's just incumbent upon us to be good managers that we can run a lot of cows per FTE. Now, if you're a 100, 200 cow ranch, and there are a lot of them in the United States, then you have to ask your question. Can we, can we afford a full-time FTE? Probably not. So you might have to say, okay, what can I do? How many cows can I run in a quarter of my time? And then what do I do with the other three quarters of my time? Do I shoe horses for the neighbors or do I, do I truck cattle for the neighbors or do I have a day job in town? And then what do I do, you know, 
what do, how how little of that one FTE can I do a good job of taking care of a smaller number of cows if that's all the cows I have? And then fed feed versus grazed feed, which we've talked about already. The more we can graze and the less we can feed, the better off we are. Those three ratios are huge in terms of profitability. So examples of systems thinking, which we talked about early, cattle size and growth rate, don't have time to talk about that, but you can see if you, if you get more growth rate and you push on APDs for growth, your cow size will get bigger. So you've kind of shot yourself in the foot. Same with milking ability. If we can't see that when we ask our cows to give more milk, that we've got to run fewer cows, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about systems thinking. Heterosis, maximum heterosis, or just a nice level. We want to talk more about optimum. Calving season, what's optimum? What's the best time of year for you? Won't be the same in every place, but what's the best time of year for you in your calving season when you consider all the other things around that, grazing management, et cetera? Cow adaptation to the calving season. Wormers and insecticides. Don't have time to go through that, but we don't think very much about the effects of wormers and insecticides other than killing the worms and the insects. But a lot of other things happen. Um, cows lose their resistance to those things, and they can develop natural resistance if we select them to do so. Anyway, a lot, lot to talk about there. Go ahead, Alan. So for profitable decision-making, become a systems thinker. In our, in our school, and I think I remember the name of it, we're going to talk about livestock, economics, finance, and marketing. We hopefully can help you become better systems thinkers. You can think integrative and holistically, or you can be a systems thinker and, and, and integrative. So you think, plan, execute, observe, and adjust holistically. Thank you, Bert. Really appreciate that. And now we're going to transition to Kent Donaga. And Kent joined us about a year ago. Um, I actually refer to Kent as the human calculator. <laughs> because he can run numbers in his head faster than we can run our numbers across the keyboard of our calculators. So, uh, Kent, uh, welcome, and the floor Thank is you. yours. Okay, put my first slide. I'm going to run through these pretty quick. A lot of these are pretty self-explanatory, but, you know, I spend a lot of, a lot of time and will at the school, what I refer to, Burke, Bert mentioned repeatedly how you think. I refer to it as the head game. Um, understanding ag, we refer to it as context. It's why you do what you do and how you do it and why you think it. And I don't think we spend nearly enough time on it. Um, and like Bert said, everybody's got everybody. You, you're going to incur costs. You cannot. You don't have any choice in that, but how you spend it. It's what, I, it's what I define as an expense. And you do have a choice. You, you can spend it or not. Sales, gross receipts, gross revenue, whoever you're talking to, that's, that's, that's what you make. That's money in. Marketing, how you sell it, is how you do it. And you do have a choice. And like Burke said, a lot of people make less than optimum choices. I put it i put it that way. So, yeah, like I said, I mean, everybody wants to win. Nobody nobody starts out saying I want to be a loser, but, you know, a lot of us, and we're going to cover a lot of record keeping and, you know, quite simply, you know, a spreadsheet is good and valuable and will tell you a lot more, but the first thing it requires, whether you're using a big chief tablet and a crayon or an Excel spreadsheet, you gotta have the discipline to do it. Um, we need to sit down and quite frankly, apply as much effort to keeping our books as we do chopping ice when it's, when, when it's cold or feeding our stock. Nobody's gonna leave their stock and we shouldn't leave our books. And I, 
lot of these, maybe you've heard them, maybe you haven't, they're kind of modified. I modified them. So everybody's heard of a parrot. Well, your paradigms. Well, a paradigm is what you think, like I said, how you do it and why you do it. It's how you operate. Status quo, I, read, I, I found this a while back, literally interpreted, interpreted is the mess we're in. And I think a lot of people say, well, I'm just, I'm just want to maintain the status quo. Well, then that's, then that's probably what you will do. You will stay in the mess you are in. And if you want to know what, what you think, if you want to define your paradigm, what you think and how, look at your results. They, they utterly define your paradigms. And most of them you get from your tribe or your community, your family, your friends, the people you listen to, right or wrong. Next slide, Alan. I'm going to cover this pretty fast. Uh, a lot of it's a repeat of what Burke said, and he probably, quite frankly, does a better job than me, but it's worth repeating. You, you, have, you have got, you've got to watch the overheads. We all have a lot of stuff, and stuff is fun, but it's also expensive. So I use the three reallys. If, if, if you're going to invest in an overhead, you better make sure that you really need it. Number two, you better make sure you can really pay for it. If it's not generating gross revenue at, at best and income preferably, it's probably not a wise investment. And you better make sure you're really going to use it. Uh, wear it out. If you're not wearing it out, sit down, get your head right, and see if, see, see kind of try to think about what would life be if I didn't have this. Like Burke said, I, I'm, I'm kind of a saddle cowboy. I don't want to consider life without a horse, but I've got two of them. And I haven't been on them in a while, and I'm considering selling them, at least one. I'm going to keep one. And I don't remember where I read this. It's not original to me, but you can write as much fiction with an Excel spreadsheet as you can Microsoft Word. So be careful. <laughs> Another one of my sayings, Alan, is that most wounds are self-inflicted. And that's especially true with me, and I don't like it but it is still the truth. Um, I'll do this pretty quick. One, on there, one thing on there I want to mention. So your cost, cost is like, the, like a balance point or the fulcrum on a lever. And if you move it in the right direction, you can get a lot more leverage. You can do a lot more. I don't, most of us think that we think that we, that our costs are as absolute rock bottom as, as they can get. But in all reality, there's probably some things that we could get rid of or do different that, that would change that and give us a longer, give us more leverage. Um, I'm not going to go over gross margin here. I, Bert covered it. I, I would say that, that, that the inventory is very important. Some years back, I came up short quite a bit of money and it took me several very worrisome days to figure out that I did I, that, I, that I had incurred a substantial increase in inventory. That's where the money I thought I'd lost. It's like, oh, I have 300 more calves turned out. Um, and again, to repeat, Bert, you know, you can decrease overheads, you can lower them, get them lower. You can dilute them with more units. Uh, you can sell them. That's a good way to get rid of, that's a good way to reduce overheads. Yeah. I have a rule, if I don't use it in two years, I turn it to money. And then decrease direct costs. That's just, that's just being more efficient. Next slide, Alan. Again, I'm going to repeat it. Most people, and we have been taught, it has been hammered in us to think profit per cow, weaning weights, more pounds. Not necessarily more pounds at a profit, but gross. The gross is what we're after. The more you produce, the more you'll make. And that is true sometimes, but it's certainly not true every time. Go to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and I'm, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna preface this with, there, there is a lot of good and valuable research. I, don't, I know some people that do a reasonably good job of price forecasting. They would probably tell you they did a lot better job, but my favorite quote, maybe in the whole world, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is quite a bit. I cannot improve on that statement. Nothing works in practice like it does in the real world. And, and we all 
to some degree intuitively know that. And if, if we see something or see research, we tend to modify it unconsciously to fit our operation. And I think, I think if that's done with a lot more conscious effort, we'd probably be a lot better off. Um, I have a friend actually, uh, he's a research scientist, told, said that he's a research, research is like meatloaf. Before you eat it, you better know who cooked it and what's in it. And the only meatloaf I eat is my wife's, Alan. And, the, you know, there's a lot of ifs with regards to price forecasting. You know, if you say, you know, well, if the price of corn stays moderate and if it rains in the wheat pasture areas and if imports don't go up and we, if we maintain exports and if domestic demand stays the same, then the price of fat cattle should say this in a $5 range for the rest of this quarter and most of the next. Only if you change one of those ifs, it changes the other four. Nothing's in a vacuum. And, and when you start doing that at that, at that minute, they lose their context and, and, and then it's a new ball game. And we tend, to, we tend to read what our brain hears is the price of fat cattle is going to stay the same. And that's probably not what they're saying, but they're not correcting you if they know that's what you're thinking. Um, you know, kill your sacred cow. If you're sitting at, we should sit down and, and this is especially true with marketing. You know, wh why am I doing this? Why am I not doing something else? I mean, it gets back to the head game. I mean, you know, you ask people, okay, why, why are you selling now? And, I, and it's worth me. I'm going I'm to back up and we'll cover this extensively in the school. Price forecasting is radically different than seasonality. Seasonality is a, a balling, unweaned 500 pound bull calf in October is the low. I'm not going to tell you I think he's going to be this many dollars per hundred weight or this, but I can tell you with nearly 100% accuracy, he's going to be a lot cheaper in October than he is April. Just like a cold cow is going to be a lot cheaper in October than she is May. That, that's, that's nearly a, a given 20 to 25% increase. And by the way, Burke, I, I did some research. You were talking about marketing your cold cows. Cold cow sales are, are, usually between 15 to 25 percent of the gross receipts of a ranch and that's part of the reason we're going to we're going to talk about them extensively you know that's that's a that's a fourth of your gross and most of us just load them up and haul them to the sale barn next slide alan uh we're gonna we will spend some time on this the value of gain and that is not the price that is that is the price relationships between two different classes of cattle what it will tell you realistically is that that's what if you're gonna if you've got if you've got your calves and you're thinking okay do i need to should i sell them now or should i precondition them everybody's weaning calves very 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 short math and you could say okay the market right now and it could change next week we've endured a the markets took a pretty good beating this week so i mean it's a given if your sales price is going to be cheaper, but the relationship between, say, from 600 to 650 pounds. You know, if it's, say, that that weight's worth a buck ten a pound. You sell 50 pounds and you're going to make 55 bucks. All right, if it's costing you a buck twenty to put it on, obviously, that's a bad deal. In that case, you'd sell the cattle. And we're, like I said, we're going to go, you know, the one of the biggest one of the biggest lies perpetrated on us and mostly on ourselves is the bigger the calf, the bigger the check. And that's usually true, but what it does infers, but is incorrect is the bigger the calf, the bigger the profit. And it's especially true when we're grazing cattle because the, the cost of gain is not necessarily something we're cutting a check for the end of the month. The feed is. You can compare a four, and if you're and if you're a stalker guy like me, you, you you can you can look at you know four weights versus five weights. Um, hedging and LRP, hedging hedging is complex and complicated enough. I'm not going to go into it. 
Um, but I, I would say right now, with, with the volatility in the market, if you don't have about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars excess cash laying around to make margin calls, and I'll go over what those are. They're not a lot of fun. I know, Alan, you've made some, and I've made more than I would like. I mean, that's that's kind of what it takes to buy the handful of chips, guys. Um, LRP is a government program. It's basically using pooled options. Um, I have used it, and I will tell you, I really, really like it. Um, Uncle Sam picks up part of the part of the cost, which is, is, is no small amount these days, and they will carry your money until you sell your cattle. Um, it's fairly complicated, but once you kind of sort through it, you can you, you've got to know you've got to know your sale date, and you've got to know your sale weight, and you've got to know you need to know that they're, they're going to ask you. You, know, you want to you want to you want your minimum price at 240 do you want it at 250 at 260 and obviously the higher the price the more you pay um that's all i'll that's kind of very very brief on it like i said it's it's kind of like a lot of burke stuff we don't we don't really have time to do it now but it's, it's an extremely useful risk management tool Okay, had to get myself unmuted. All right, so thank you, Kent. Now our next presenter is Dr. Randy Little. Um, now you'll have to forgive Randy. He did about 30 plus years in academia as a uh, ag econ professor. And he is now like me, a recovering academic. So uh, Randy, turn it over to you, sir. Well, thanks, Alan. Um, you know, it's a risk to uh, invite a, a professor to speak. We're kind of programmed to go 55 minutes or 75 minutes. So I'll try to honor the time commitment. But uh, um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, too. My comments uh, this evening are to echo what, what Burke and, and Kent shared already. In fact, they stole some of my thunder, but um, um, a key point that, that we want to make is, is a basic from Intro to Ag Econ, and that's maximizing output is not the same as maximizing profit. In fact, the only, only uh, time they will be the same is when output prices are infinitely high, which I'm sure we'd agree is not too likely, or when all of your inputs are free, uh, probably even less likely. Uh, how would those, how would those uh, sales rep afford caps to give up everywhere? Um, and feel free to contact me if you if you want to dig deeper into into that 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 one. But uh, since they're not the same, yield max and and profit max. Which one should we focus on? Surely you have a have a hint which direction we'd go. Um, I mean, you know the the sales rep what what they're going to be after because they want to move as much product as they can. Um, extension specialists, especially from say ag agronomy or animal science, their mindset is is maximizing output. So. Uh, They'll, they'll stress that <clears throat> more more pounds weaned per cow or more yields per acre. Um, we will focus more on on the profit maximizing stuff. So hopefully we'll we'll get some some economics built into the model. We economists like to to focus on incremental changes. So if we change the input by a unit, what happens to output, and consequently what happens to the profit function. I used to I used to use fertilizer as an example. So uh, <clears throat> spread units of fertilizer and, and with each incremental unit added, what happens to yields? But uh, with 
the emphasis on regenerative ag is we work to minimize soil disturbance and using chemical fertilizers uh, disturbs the soil. That example goes out the window. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we'll talk more about, about cow size. So what are we after? Uh, Burke's already talked about matching your herd to the resource base. Um, that decision's loaded with, with economic relationships. Kind of tied to that would be our, our production decisions, whether it's the breed type we, we choose, uh, mature cow size, all that stuff. We want to look at those decisions based on on uh, the anticipated effect on, on net returns. So we want to look at the entire the entire profit function. So we got profit, uh, total revenue minus total costs, where total costs are made up of uh, variable or, or direct costs and fixed costs, also called overheads. So as we as we look to to change how we produce things, what we produce. What's going to be the effect on each of those pieces? <clears throat> and kind of embedded in all of that would be gathering the right data, not just gathering data for the sake of gathering data for sure, but making sure that we're measuring the right thing uh, that, that's going to best inform our, our decisions. So again, let's, let's focus on... on uh, cow size and some of the implications that, that we can look at there. <clears throat> these, these data reported in this, this table are, are drawn from uh, SPA data collected uh, some years ago. That's standardized, standardized performance analysis. A bunch of states cooperated on that, and gathered actual production data from, from cooperating producers. They, defined what, what they were going to be measuring so that there was consistency across all, all of the operations when, when they collected the data. Um, so these are numbers based on those, those, actual, uh, those actual data collected. So what happens is we, we change cow size. So we look down the table, we see uh, mature cow weight increasing in, in 100 pound inc increments. Um, let's see, so um, we see the weaning weights. Again, those are, are tied to the data reported from the, the, the spot collections. Um, we like to, we economists like to look at, at uh, those incremental changes. So like changing from a thousand pound cow to an eleven hundred pound cow. There's a fifty pound increase in weaning weights, and and so on. You can see that gets smaller and smaller as as uh, the cows get bigger, all the way down to just a a two pound increase from a fourteen hundred pound cow to a fifteen hundred pound cow. Um, that's fine and dandy for what it's worth. Uh, we already already talked about not looking just at weaning weights per cow. That's what reported in that column. Um, let's think instead about, um, uh, well, we saw the, the, the calf value. Why don't you move back up one, Alan? We saw the calf value at weaning, how it increased um, as the calves got bigger and, and uh, the cows got bigger. Um, but again, that's that's calf value per cow, not the metric that that we want to focus on. Um, might be tempting to look at that, see how how that gross revenue per per cow was increasing as as calf size increased, and think, well, let's uh, let's run with it. But um, uh, with that decision to increase the cow size, there are other things that, that come into play that uh, Burke and Kent have already alluded to. So um, we can, can uh, 
look at the, at the requirements per cow in terms of the, the acres required. This is uh, for a farmer ranch in the in the southeast. Um, uh, just for for illustration purposes, but so we're assuming um, four acres per cow, and then it goes up from there. And uh, we're assuming a, a 400 acre operation. So four acres per cow, we can have a 100, 1,000 pound cows. And then that decreases as cow size goes up because we have to allocate more acres per cow. So ends up um, only 67 head of those, those big 1,500 pound cows. Um, so what, what's the combined effect? Well, let's see. It's not just the cow size and, and more acres, though. The calf crop percentage decreases with with the bigger cows. You know, when economists well, got to learn more about the, the animal science side of things, but uh, tougher to rebreed them, um, keep the body condition score high enough and all that stuff to to get them in, in condition, but uh, kind of a double whammy going on there. Fewer cows because of the acreage requirements and a, a lower calf crop percentage as the cows get bigger. Again, these data are from, from the SPA data collected, so not like we're making things up on that, that column. Um, so we see how any perceived benefit on the per cow basis is uh, um, kind of lost as uh, we we switch to a a, a per acre metric. Again, we reflect the that double whammy uh, in the the pounds weaned per acre. Let's see. All right, you can go on the next next slide. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this total value across the for the for the whole cow herd. Um, again, that, that that double whammy of of uh, more acres per cow and a lower lower calf crop percentage. Um, Pretty big penalty for for running those bigger cows, rather than uh, running more cows and 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 selling lighter weight calves, uh, to the tune of about thirty nine thousand dollars for the operation, for the thousand pound cows versus the the fifteen hundred pound cows. Um, that that just kind of looks at at one part of of the profit function, uh, just the 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 gross revenue measure um, we'll leave digging into to the rest of the profit function so thinking about um feeding those cows when we're not grazing uh for example what happens to to the cost measures um, suffice it to say though that it uh, doesn't get any rosier for those those big cows uh, so maybe <clears throat> bragging at the coffee shop or the sale barn is is worth uh, is worth it to you. Running big cows to have big weaning weights, but uh, I promise the bottom line will be will be much happier if you consider all of the effects on the entire profit function and again matching matching cow size and requirements to to the resource base. Um, another key aspect of, of the kind of the basic and applied ag econ, the production economics in particular, it would be enterprise selection. <clears throat> um, one of the basic things from, from an intro to ag econ class is that any type of economy has to decide what and how much to produce, how to produce it, and who gets what. Um, Thankfully, we we still have some latitude 
in this country how some of that stuff plays out, uh, particularly with the what to produce and how much to produce and how to produce it questions. Um, one thing that, that we'll dig into at the workshop will be a, a set of, of decision calculators that uh, Alan has, has, uh, has developed. The goal there would be to uh, help you Im improve your decisions. You can ask what if questions um, and uh, uh, explore different alternatives in terms of uh, of resource allocation and, and enterprise selection. So you're answering um, what to produce and how to produce it. Um, even even a, a, an approach that considers regenerative agriculture versus conventional agriculture. Still some of those basic concepts from, from intro to, to ag econ. So um, our Decision calculators would be help, helpful for, for building a business plan that you take to your lender. Um, you need to be able to, to defend your projections and, and these calculators help you help you accomplish that, building the, putting together reasonable production assumptions and, and uh, uh, look at look at the, the outcomes. So we'll again we'll we'll dig into the the tools in in some depth, um, and you'll be able to customize the calculations to your farm or ranch. So come come to the workshop bringing bringing data from from your farm. Uh, we'll we'll help you know what to what to pick. But um, um, so we had the the beef decision calculator kind of addresses all the segments of, of the live beef production process. So you can look at uh, retaining ownership or, or uh, um, one piece or multiple pieces of the process. Look at um, running, running stalker cows. So um, rather than run them to the sale barn at weaning in the fall, you um, keep them through till the spring and, and uh, Capitalize on that on that favorable price seasonality move. Um, uh, uh, poultry calculators, um, pastured eggs, broilers, turkeys. Um, got other other enterprises. Uh, pastured pigs. Uh, we'll be ready with some grass based dairy and and goat. Calculators got pasture sheep stuff ready, so um, just a, a an array of, of very useful tools that um, will help you kind of know what what information together. So um, key benefit of of the of the exercise of using the calculators will will be digging into your numbers learning about your operation in that way. Uh, so just like going out in, into the into a field or a pasture and, and observing, we'll be observing the, the uh, um, some production records and, and financial records and, and uh, um, you'll get better at, at, at pegging at pegging your costs, you know, calculating more accurate break evens and, and so on. So um, we'll we'll look forward to to having some fun playing with those. Yeah, back to you, Al. Thanks, Randy. So, just a few quick summary and conclusions here. You know, obviously, in in a one hour webinar, we can only hit the broad topics. Uh, to be able to really implement practical economic, financial, and marketing solutions that takes some time. And what we decided to do with an understanding ag was that there was a need for workshops that were very practical, uh, workshops that allow you to be able to plug in your own numbers on your own operations 
and understand exactly what you need to do within your context. So in the marketing workshops that we're going to start in January, we are going to bring very practical solutions, but the solutions to most people are also non-conventional. We're going to teach you how to increase net profitability, how to make the right economic and financial and marketing decisions, how to be much more resilient in your operations, and how to use real-world decision calculators to be able to determine what decisions you should make. And you're going to be able to take those calculators home with you and utilize those on a day-in, day-out basis. One thing we are going to focus on is how do you maximize net profit per acre? And how do you revolutionize your farm or ranch in achieving production and financial goals? What are the major determinants for you for profitability? And what are the practical steps you need to take for effective management and marketing decision making. I mentioned building resilience in challenging times, which we certainly have a lot of those right now. What are the key records that you really need to be keeping? How do you establish the right mindset? Kent talked about the mind game. You know, that is an important part of it. And then we're also going to teach you how to ask and answer the right questions. So that's going to be the core focus of what we're going to do in the marketing schools. Now, the first couple of schools that we do will be core focused on livestock and multi-enterprise livestock operations, but we are going to develop and offer workshops that will be focused on row cropping and specialty cropping as well. Uh, the livestock school will cover dairy decision-making, as well as beef and other types of livestock. So that being said, the first Livestock Economics, Finance, and Marketing Workshop will be held in Kansas City, Missouri on January the 10th through the 11th, coming up in 2024. Uh, you can go to our website to take a look at that and to sign up if you're interested. Uh, our next webinar will feature Chuck Shimbry, another member of our Understanding Ag staff. And Chuck is going to core focus on specialty crops, particularly orchard crops and vineyard crops. So for those of you that have an interest in that area, please be sure to play. Alan. Can you hear me, Bert? I can hear you now. You were muted there for just a bit. Yeah, so we're going to go to Q&A now. Um, so the first question is, will we have access to the slides? Will the recording be available? So yes, all of our uh, webinars are recorded and archived. So you can go back and watch them at any point in time that you want to. The second question, Kent, this is for you. It says, Kent, have you taken the Bud Williams sell-by schools or where have you picked up the true value of gain calculation? I can't tell you where the, the first time I saw it, but I, I will say this. If I mean, if, if you're, and I realize I'll, probably most people aren't, I've bought a lot of cattle on orders and I've bought a lot of my own cattle. So when the sale's over, they give you something called a recap and it lists everything you buy. So if say you're buying somebody a 300 pound heifer and she's costing $2 a pound, that's 600 bucks. And it's all, that's one line on there. All of that information along with the head count. If you're buying somebody a 400 pound heifer and she costs, I don't know, let's say the, the, the smaller heifer was 600 and the, and the, and the bigger heifer was 650. I mean, after a while you look at it, you think, man, that hundred pound difference is just 50 bucks. That's probably where I, where I first started. Um, I actually did go to a Bud Williams 
actually Doug Ferguson's, who's a student of it was it's Bud Williams course about three or four months ago, mainly because I just wanted to see if there was anything different that there wasn't. I mean, a lot of a lot of people picked up on it. And if you really pay attention to marketing and, and, and that's probably my first love and it's what I'm good at. It's like, when is the best time to sell this? It probably late nineties, I figured out I was buying a 250 pound calf and trying to make them weigh eight. And kind of just through looking, I figured out that if, if that, if that system was going to make a hundred bucks, I usually had 90 or more made in him by the time he weighed six. And from there, it's a simple steps like, okay, so why am I keeping him that last 150, 200 pounds? Let's sell him and go buy another one. And so I did, and and then I, the the first time I ever heard this the sell buy and the Bud Williams, somebody asked me that question. I'm like, look, you know, I, I I don't know, but probably a lot of people besides Bud figured it out in one form or another. He just named it and was probably better at teaching it than most most of us. Thanks, Kent. Uh, Rob is asking, are you guys coming to Canada with the school? Uh, <laughs> Rob, we sure hope to. Uh, we don't have dates yet for that, but absolutely, we hope to do that. Uh, Eric asks, we have talked mainly about cattle, and that's true. Uh, well, most of these philosophies apply to things such as small ruminants as well. So, Eric, the, the quick answer to that is absolutely. Uh, the, the schools will be focused on multi-enterprise and all livestock species, including poultry, not just large and small ruminants, but pigs, poultry, and all of that as well. And we will have decision calculators that cover though all of the species. And we'll be talking about how do you integrate these species and how do you make those decisions? For instance, as we add more and more of other species, are we going to need to destock maybe some of our cattle or some of our sheep? What how do we how do we make those determinations? So we're going to cover things like that in the school as well. Anything else to add to that, Burke, Randy, or Kent? Well, I would certainly agree with that, Alan. Uh, that we'll talk some basic concepts that just apply across the board, and probably because Kent and I have done most of our life with cattle, we'll we'll probably be there a little more, but the whole thing applies to the small ruminants applies to pork and poultry. And, uh, it's basically, it's basically sizing decisions all or none or part or what, how do you get the best enterprise mix possible for your unique situation? That that's exactly right, Burke. And, you know, probably the vast majority of you on the webinar tonight, have heard us talk over and over again about the principles of soil health. And when you hear us talking about those, you hear us say that the principles apply no matter what, no matter where your farm or ranch is located, no matter what your soil type is, no matter what your climate is. And that is very true. And it is exactly the same folks with economics, finances, and marketing. The principles apply no matter what. And, and so in, in the schools, you're going to be learning those core principles pertaining to economics, financing, and marketing. So that then no matter what your agronomic enterprise, your livestock enterprise, no matter what that may be, these principles are going to apply. And you're going to be able to run those numbers utilizing the same tools that we are going to teach you. Uh, Ted says, it's hard to argue with doing what you're good at. Uh, totally agree, Ted. Totally agree. Uh, Nikki says, it is my understanding that there may be more offerings of schools or meetings. When will you know where and what topic? Livestock versus cropping. I would be interested in both. So, Nikki, to answer that very quickly, uh, we have the first two up on the website. So just go to understandingag.com, click on, go to our resources page, click on workshops, 
and you can see where and when the first two, and then we'll be planning the next ones and getting those out on the website at least, typically at least uh, three months ahead of time uh, so that you'll have plenty of time to plan. And we will be letting you know within those notices whether these are going to be livestock focused or crop focused and yes, where they are going to be located. What we're trying to do is locate these near a major airport hub in many different regions around North America so that it's easy for people to get into and back out of. So I have a question for our speakers. Why do we typically tend to have the exact same problems in economics, finances, and marketing and agriculture repeated over and over again for literally decades now? What What's the issue, guys? Well, I'll jump in, Alan. I think what I have noticed is what I call paradigm lockdown. We get a way of doing something and then we're just become very resistant to change. And, uh, and I, uh, I had a couple of experiences when I was young and I won't take time to tell those that knocked some sense into my head and said, Hey, just because the Tykert ranch did, it doesn't mean that the whole world needs to do it that way to be doing it right. Um, uh, and you learn that, that better ideas come, things change. You know, I, I used to think I wanted more grass so I could run more cattle. It's taken a while, but I'm to where, hey, I want to improve the soil. If I get the soil better, we'll have we'll have more plant growth, more variety, and then I have choices. Is it cattle? And if it's cattle, what kind of cattle? Or is it small ruminants? Or is it a combination? And, uh, you know, I just think we get that paradigm lockdown. We don't want to get out of that. Uh and then I worry when we get the new paradigm that we don't build a new box for ourselves, that we keep we keep the box kicked open so, so our vision is still broad and we don't get into a, a new paradigm lockdown. Absolutely. Kent, in your experience, you've got a lot of years in the cattle business. So <laughs> why do we tend to repeat the same problems over and over? I think maybe it's the way, the way I say what Burke is, I use a definition of inertia and that's change. People fear change. When I got in the stalker business, my dad was nervous about me being in the stalker business until the day he died. And he probably still is in heaven. He didn't like it. And I, and I, and, and, and I, I guess in all fairness, there's a, there's a lot of people that are maybe not in the best place financially. I think a lot of people don't change because they're worried they can't afford to pay for for it if it's wrong. They they may not be making it may they may not be making it good, but they're making it okay, and they they just can't afford to pay many speeding tickets. And that's actually kind of, I guess probably I had one of those moments too, Burke. I came up about twenty grand short, and one of my mentors told me he said, "Look, he said I'll, he said." Don't worry about it, but I assure you, I worried about it, and I spent no small amount of time wondering why did this happen. But I, I think, I think, I think it's just habit. I think people just don't want to change, and that that's maybe an oversimplification. And the older I get, it's like you know, I, I'm starting to understand that a lot of those, well, those old men when I was 30, 40 years ago, they're starting to make a lot more sense. And I think a lot of it's like. If, the, if we're wrong, it's going to be really, really bad. And they'll, they'll trade mediocrity now for, for, for the uncertain. I think that's very true. And, and Randy, I'm going to ask you, so you, you spent 30, 30 years at the university and uh, I spent 15 years at a university teaching. And so universities are supposed to be cutting edge. So, and, and teach the latest and the greatest. So why do we still have the same problems occurring? That's a good question. Um, 
And part of it's probably um, in some departments, the source of the funding, um, big ag companies have uh, have their own agendas and they want they want uh, results that that align with those agendas. Uh, I get in trouble for saying that, but I retired already, so I don't have to worry about that too much. But um, uh, I would say there's there's also a lot of a lot of peer pressure. Um, there's there's certainly a lot of inertia within within um, departments, land grant ag colleges. People are just kind of tied into to, uh, um, doing things the way we always have. They look for for maybe some uh, flashy developments, um, but I think a lot of people people are tend towards being prescriptive. They want to be told what to do and when to do it. So you know, just be told the next steps, and and they they do that. Uh, so what uh, you're saying. Randy, is that university faculty have the same problem that many farmers and ranchers do. They're not immune to the exact same biases and issues. Exactly. Yeah. We've got another question here from Rob. He says, how about mixed farms? Will your calculators compare price relationships and profit per acre of, say, cash crops versus stockers, as an example. So to answer that, Rob, yes, we will be prepared to do that. Uh, we've actually had this asked quite a bit of us, and many of our clients do have mixed operations, livestock and crop. So we will be prepared at our schools to be able to make those comparisons to help you make the right decisions relative to the specific types of enterprise that you want to run on any given acre at any given point in time. And keep in mind as well that um, yeah, any acre can also transfer back and forth. Yeah, livestock, crop, crop, livestock. Uh, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of different options here that we're going to help you explore. Alan, there, would, there. Nikki had a, another question that I typed an answer in. So click on the answered. Um, oh, okay. And um, just comment on 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 that one. Yes, if you, we actually do want you bringing your own data to the workshops, uh, Nikki. So and and to everyone, everyone that comes. We heavily encourage you to bring your own numbers because we want to be able to work with you, you know, individualized to plug these numbers into the decision calculators and help you reach the right decisions. So please do come prepared. Uh, that you'll get a whole lot more out of it uh, if you do. And I would add to the, with regards to Rob's question, you know, it may be, and, and this kind of ties into the inertia, but a lot of those comparisons, I mean, if you're being honest, if you're not writing fiction with your numbers, you know, you may find out that what's making the money is maybe not what you want to do the most. That among other things that got me in the stalker business in the, in the, in the mid eighties was I, I wanted to be a cow man, just like my dad and uncle. And I was trying to breed heifers and it was, well, I'll be nice to myself. My timing was bad off and let's leave it at that. And when I got done and I was sitting down and scribbling with my crayon on my big chief pad, I realized that the open heifers had made a lot more money than the ones I got bred. <laughs> and so after about the second time, I'm like, what if you just ran open heifers and didn't buy a bull and ta-da, you're in the stalker business. Chase writes, he says, I can't remember where I read it, 
but there is a fear that you might win that holds people back as well. And I, I, I would agree with that, Chase, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know how many people tonight knew or remember who Dr. Gordon Hazard was. Uh, Dr. Hazard was a very good friend of mine, uh, has the farm that his son now runs that is pretty close to our farm here in Mississippi. And in his latter years, he and I traveled together a lot going to conferences. So this was a man that had literally been in the cattle business since 1935 that I got to sit to and listen to for hours and hours driving, driving to conferences and workshops where we were speaking together. And it, it was quite amazing to listen to a person that had experienced the cattle industry for literally decades and decades. And the one thing that really struck me in listening to him is that from 1935 to well into the 2000s, in terms of the fundamentals, nothing really changed. Nothing really changed. Doc Hazard was still doing the same things in the 2000s that he was doing in the 1940s and 50s to make money. And it was still working in the 2000s. Alan, tell, yes. them, tell them Doc's overhead. <laughs> so, you know, Burke and uh, Kent both talked about, you know, and Randy did as well, reducing overhead. Well, Doc just believed the best way to reduce overhead was to not have any overhead. Uh, he he believed that if you owned anything that <clears throat> would rust, you needed to get rid of it. And he said the only thing that he owned that would rust was a hammer so he could fix his fence. That, that was about it. But uh, he never, this was a man that ran thousands and thousands of stocker calves each year. The man never owned a tractor, ever. He always hired it out. He never owned a one-ton dually with a nice gooseneck, ever. He always hired that out. He, he drove out to his farm every day from his house in town in a little old Chevy S10 pickup. That was it. You know, he, he didn't even want a half-ton pickup. He just used his little S10. Uh, his corrals, absolutely nothing fancy there whatsoever. As a matter of fact, if you didn't know that they were corrals, you probably would have never thought that they were. Super simple in terms of what he did. So, you know, the man understood what it took to run livestock and what it didn't take to run livestock. And he understood that heavy metal is not what it takes to run livestock. One of the things I, I, I did IRM and spa analysis folks for more than 20 years. And the one thing that shocked me initially and then became commonplace over the 20 years of doing this IRM spa analysis is that way too many farms owned, had more dollars invested in heavy metal than they did in livestock. And last week I was doing workshops up in the state of Virginia, in the Piedmont section of Virginia. And I had some people there told me that an analysis had been done on production of hay in the Piedmont section of Virginia. And they said that every year they average producing about $26 million worth of hay in the Piedmont section. But the producers of that hay own $95 million worth of haymaking equipment. What's wrong with that picture, folks? Alan, I might jump in here for a second. Uh, we talk about the six principles of soil health and that those work any place in the world. Now, the practices around those principles need to change to fit your context, where you are, what you're doing. I managed ranches in the state of Washington, Nebraska, 
Montana, Oklahoma, Argentina, Southern Alberta. And I think I use the same management principles that I kind of quickly outlined here today on every one of those ranches, but the practices could never be the same. I think what we intend to do in this school is help people design their practices to obey those principles. And then they're going to be okay. They don't have to worry about out-of-pocket expenditures to get up and going because they will reduce enough cost to pay for the added expenditures. It, uh, their, their changes should be, should generate profits from the get go. Absolutely. Bert. I don't think anyone could have said that any better. That, that is 100% correct. Okay, folks, any other questions? I don't see any more being typed in. Does anybody want to unmute and speak a question? Okay. Well, folks, we really appreciate you being here this evening. We always, always appreciate the questions. Um, again, these workshops are designed, as Burke said, with your individual farm and ranch context in mind. That is absolutely what matters. That's how they're going to be taught. Please do come again with your numbers, your situation in hand so that we can help you absolutely as best possible. We want you to leave there having the ability to be, be able to make absolutely outstanding decisions once you return home. We do have one other question here from Lynn. Will there be a virtual option? I'm assuming that means of the workshops. Uh, we are planning that in the future. For right now, we're going to have live workshops. Uh, but at some point, as we go forward into the future, we will also do online versions as well. So, with that, folks, we appreciate everybody joining in this evening. Again, remember uh, the next webinar 7 p.m. Central Time, November the 9th, featuring our own Understanding Ag's Chuck Shimbry. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great evening. Goodbye.